generalmente yo de mi casa salgo a las 10 de la mañana. Ya empiezo a recorrer hasta que hace hace las 3 de la tarde que vengo acá a este parque. Aquí estoy como hasta las 8, 9 de la noche. Rosa Pizarro came here from Ecuador three years ago, and she's been struggling to make a living ever since. Her business selling ice cream is typical of the kind of scrappy, informal enterprises that poor immigrants start around here. She doesn't have employees, or a retirement plan, or even a license to operate. What she does have is a tenacious entrepreneurial spirit. Esta es una manera de, de llevar, siendo yo mismo la administradora, no tengo que depender de nadie y le pongo un poquito más de empeño porque es algo que me va a, re, me va a venir a mí mismo las ganancias y todo. But even a modest business like this requires capital to get off the ground. And that was Rosa's biggest challenge. She needed $400 for a cart, $150 to fill it with ice cream, money for cones and cups and spoons, and the biggest expense you can't even see, $700 for a freezer to store the ice cream overnight. Living well below the poverty line, Rosa didn't have that kind of money. And with no collateral and no credit history, she had no chance of getting a bank to lend it to her. So instead, she's taking part in a revolution in finance that some people think is the key to ending poverty. It's called microcredit. The local headquarters of this revolution is a one-room office above a laundromat in Queens. This is a special kind of bank, one that doesn't require collateral, a credit history, or business experience from its borrowers. From here, thousands of small loans are being given out to help poor, would-be entrepreneurs get on their feet. But the idea for this bank didn't start here in America. It's a rare example of an aid program making its way from the third world to the first. The man behind it all was an unknown Bangladeshi economist who has become the leader of a global movement. His name is Mohammed Yunus. In 1976, Yunus created something he called the Grameen Bank. He started making tiny loans of just a few dollars apiece to a group of poor rural women in Bangladesh. He was stunned to find that even though his borrowers would never have made it through the door of a regular bank, they still paid their loans back on time with interest. The microloans allowed people who were barely scraping by to develop small businesses and transform themselves into small-time entrepreneurs. It is opposite of the city bank or any financial institutions. Shah Nawaz oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Grameen's American offshoot, which opened its doors in 2008. Nawaz spent decades working side by side with Muhammad Yunus as a banker to the poor. Now, he's taking the exact same system that was so successful in Bangladesh and putting it into action in the U.S. Bangladesh is a third world country. It's the poorest country of the world, so everybody knows that. But in my experience, we found that the same problem in the U.S., which is the most developed country of the world. This group of people, they don't have any access to the capital. For Grameen and its borrowers, the workday starts when the city is still just waking up. At meetings like this one, held every week at 6 in the morning, borrowers check in with their loan officer and make their payments. Rosa, the ice cream seller, is here with her young son. Cada semana es esta cantidad. De 84 dólares, según el préstamo. Yeah. Porque ve que el préstamo de primero viene siendo de 1,500, el segundo, bueno, yo estoy ya en el segundo préstamo que fue de 2,000, entonces por eso me toca pagar 84, que viene incluido ya la deuda y el interés en este caso. Y lo que yo dejo de un poco más es de lo que estoy dejando para ahorrar. Grameen charges 15% interest, less than many credit cards. And by repaying their loans, these women are also building a credit history, which Grameen hopes will help them graduate to mainstream banking down the road. But before they can receive a loan, borrowers are required to organize into groups of five. And if even a single person in the group fails to repay, none of the other members will be eligible for a bigger loan next time. Si 
quedar para poder colaborar con esa persona para cumplir el pago. By putting a little bit of peer pressure to work, Grameen itself doesn't have to do as much prodding, and borrowers have an incentive to weed out unreliable people when forming their groups. In America, Grameen has yet to achieve the self-sufficiency it has in Bangladesh, but its leaders say they are on track to reach that goal in a few years. When you talk to happy borrowers like these, microcredit can seem like a panacea, but the idea has recently become mired in controversy. You can't generally get in trouble by saving too much, as long as in a safe place, but you can get in trouble by borrowing too much. And I really do worry about poor people getting entrapped in debt. It's uh, possible for someone to borrow from several microfinance institutions at once. David Rudman is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., and is currently writing a book about microfinance. He has voiced concerns about the explosive growth of microcredit. It is good to give poor people more financial options, more ways to borrow and save. But it is also important to remember that credit in particular can be dangerous. And in a post-financial crisis world, I almost don't have to explain that. In fact, microcredit has just been rocked by a crisis of its own. The untapped pool of poor, would-be borrowers has proven very attractive to investors and venture capitalists. And profit-driven companies have jumped into the market, sometimes with disastrous results. In India, micro-lenders saddled poor borrowers with far more debt than they could handle. As lenders reaped massive profits, borrowers were driven to desperation, some even to suicide. There was a national backlash, with politicians telling people not to repay their micro-loans. Gurmeen, however, doesn't even operate in India, and Yunus has long been critical of the profit-driven model. David Rudman agrees that in many ways Grameen is a role model of ethical micro-lending. But, he says, by feeding the hype about microcredit, even the good guys are partly to blame for the reckless growth. They told the best stories they could about how their work was making a difference. So they went out and found the best examples of, you know, women who took small loans and started from nothing and started small businesses and lifted themselves out of poverty. And those stories sold very well. Microcredit is really appealing to uh, the general public. Success stories, Rudman argues, aren't enough to prove anything conclusive. And even what seems like a success story at first glance can be more complicated when you dig a little deeper. Take Rosen. At 9 o'clock at night on Sunday, she is still hard at work picking up some extra business at another park after other sellers have called it a day. But is Rosa moving up or just hanging on? She told us that for all of her work, her business only clears about $200 a week. Her husband gets construction jobs when he can, but that still leaves their family well below the poverty line. So, does microcredit really lift people out of poverty? Several recent studies suggest otherwise. They found no impact of microcredit on bottom line indicators of poverty, such as uh, how many kids are in school within a family, um, what is household spending, this kind of thing. And that really contradicted the public perception and almost this mythology that microcredit was a proven weapon against poverty. Rudman cautions that the new studies are not definitive. Researchers looked at only a few specific programs over a short period of time. But it's another blow to microcredit's previously stellar reputation. We don't have any mechanism how to get out the property. It is their, our borrower's uh, effort. Shaw Nawaz doesn't claim that microcredit is a silver bullet for poverty. But to him, the evidence on the ground is impossible to ignore. 